Welcome to this video on the Pharah from the tabletop role-playing game Werewolf the Apocalypse. The Gauru were not the only shape-changing species created by Gaia, nor were they created all at once. Each was born in their own time and for their own purpose, though in what order depends on who is telling the story. Then the Garu took it in their heads that they should rule all other shape-changers and even replace some of them in service to Gaia, leading to the War of Rage. Entire breeds of Pharaoh were exterminated by the werewolves, and in the end times, those who remained still followed the paths that Gaia set for them, whether the Garu like it or not. A few even hoped to bring the wolves down for their genocidal ambition, as well as their failures. But without further ado, the Pharaoh. The Ajaba. In prehistory, Gaia created the Garu, but there were certain places the werewolves were reluctant to go, especially where the children of Lion held dominion, or the warm climes were hostile to the werewolves. Regardless, few of them made their way into Proto-Africa, and this displeased Gaia. But Gaia is not a goddess to tell her creations what to do, so she created a new shape changer from a breed native to Africa, the hyena. The Bastet would support the Ajaba, as they were meant the other Pharah, directing the hyena shifters, the Ajaba, towards their true targets. But as is common in the history of shape changers, this didn't work out as planned. When the Ajaba were created, they were created in opposition to mortal and most of Pharah society. The women Ajaba were the warriors, and the men were seers and mystics. This offended the sensibilities of mortals and Pharaoh alike. The Ajaba, not too soon after their creation, fell prey to infighting predictably, largely due to what role they would fulfill, as well as opposition to the Bastet. The Bastet saw the Ajaba as useless, an impediment to their own authority as lawgivers and warriors. The Bastet decided to punish the hyena shifters for their detrimental nature. Ironically, this persecution unified the Ajaba against the Bastet, a conflict that continued to the detriment of the solitary Bastet. The Ajaba staked out their territory and defended it as only hyenas can. It was when the endless storm arose, under the leadership of King Blacktooth of the Amaduo, that the Ajaba were pushed to the brink of extinction by 1984. Blacktooth, the great king of the Simba, slew the Ajaba by the score, including their so-called king. It was not until Kisasi, the Ajaba whelp, united the shifters of Africa into the Ahadi, that Blacktooth's reign was threatened and ultimately brought down. The Ajaba, pushed to near extinction by Blacktooth, rallied to Kasasi, who led them into peaceful relations with the other African Bastet, the Garu, the Mokole, and even the Simba who defied their former king. But there are still some Ajaba who would rather nurse old grievances and hatreds than reach for the unknown future. The most vocal Ajaba calling to resume the war against the Simba is a male known as Shari. The were hyenas who follow him are willing to destroy the Ahadi and leave Africa defenseless against the worm, or the followers of Set, rather than let go of their anger. The Ajaba are fundamentally matriarchal, as the female were hyenas are generally larger, stronger, and possess more rage than their male counterparts. Male Ajaba with their higher gnosis act as the mystics and lore keepers of their clans, which include the Ajaba, their kin, and other associates. This is not an absolute rule, however. Every so often, a powerful male Ajaba appears and rises to leadership of their respective clan, or a female becomes a storyteller and shaman. It is rare, but not unheard of. Power among the Ajaba is as much a matter of alliances and followers as it is personal strength. Powerful mystics can decide the leadership of a clan according to who they support in the bloody ritual challenges of the were hyenas. To compensate for the ruthless interbreed competition between the Ajaba, they tend to breed true more often than the Garu or other Fera, at a rate of approximately 30%. The Ajaba are still struggling to rebuild their numbers even decades after Blacktooth nearly exterminated them. Additionally, the Ajaba's system of renown is changed. In the past, the Ajaba prized ferocity and cunning, like the best that they despise, but instead of honor, the Ajaba preferred infamy, which called them to wage war against the forces of the worm, the weaver, and occasionally other pharaoh, which is what caused them such problems with the Bastet in general, and the Simba in particular. Today, the Ajaba have substituted the creed of infamy for that of obligation, 
which calls for building and preparing for the future, with enough room for them to seek revenge against those who wronged them. The Ajaba are, simply put, a breed apart. Sex dictates one's role in Ajaba society. Aside from the typical conflicts between the sexes, the warlike female Ajaba and the more mystical male Ajaba have very different ideas on what is best for their clans and their breed as a whole. Complicating matters is that every generation has a handful of males and females whose typical rage and gnosis are reversed, producing male warriors and female mystics. The most notable example of this in the end times is Kisasi, the diplomat, spokeswoman, and peacemaker of the Ajaba and the Ahadi, and Shari, the male warrior who howls for the blood of the Simba, the Kuche Kindu, and pretty much anyone who he doesn't like the look of. Like the Garu, the Ajaba have three breeds. The Hamids, who are typically of African or Indian ancestry and possess the least gnosis of the breeds. The hyena possess the greatest gnosis, male hyena being on par with a lupus garu. The Metis Ajaba rest in the median for both rage and gnosis, and most are hermaphroditic. Unlike other pharaoh and even Ajaba, Metis tend to be more mentally and physically stable. Before the culling of the Ajaba, the breed only had one aspect, essentially Ragabash. As their numbers increased, two new aspects have emerged and been recognized by the elders of the Ware Hyenas, the Dawn and the Dusk. The Dawn of Jabba are filled and fueled by rage. Whatever else may be said of them, they are eager to fill the void left by the endless storm in suppressing the servants of the worm in Africa. The Dusk of Jabba are more subtle and contemplative with less rage and more insight. Like the Garu, the Ajaba also have five forms. The Hamid, or man form, the Anthros form, the human with hyena characteristics, the Krinos war form, which is slightly smaller than a Garu's, but allows them to use human-sized weapons. Yes, a monster hyena man with a machine gun is a thing. The Crocus form, which is the primordial monster hyena form, and the hyena form itself, their animal shape. Ananazi. All things originated from the Triad. In the time before time, the Wild created Gaia, who in turn created nearly all of the other pharaoh. But the Weaver created its own child as the Wild had, Ananaza. In time, Ananaza gave birth to her own child with a spider spirit, a son she named Anansi, who was the first of the Ware Spiders. Later, when the weaver gained awareness, and by consequence, madness, she attempted to trap the wild, but ended up capturing the worm, the balancer. The worm retaliated by encasing Ananaza in a perfect opal prison. With Ananaza as its hostage, the worm forced the Ananazi into its service. But Anansi, the firstborn, was as quiet and clever as he was powerful. He snuck into the heart of the worm's own prison, Malpheus, found his mother, and hatched a plan to free her. Anansi tricked the Korax and the Garu into invading Malpheus, claiming that Ananaza's prison was actually the heart of the worm, and that by destroying it, they would defeat the balancer turned corrupter. The other pharaoh managed to seize the opal prison and take it out of Malpheus, but for all of their force, they only managed to create a small crack in the opal. But that was enough for the Ananazi. Not only could they hear their queen, but the opal kept her safe from the worm's corruption. The Garu, realizing they had been tricked, swore to destroy the Ananazi, but the were spiders were too fast and went to ground before the wolves could hunt them. The Ananazi stoked the Garu's rage further and turned them against the other pharaoh, resulting in the War of Rage. The Ananazi's reason for this provocation and destruction was that the Impergium offended Queen Ananaza, who saw great potential in humanity. The War of Raid successfully weakened all of the pharaoh, and the Ananazi eventually emerged from hiding and began the great work and the will of their queen to restore the balance between the triad, what they call the symmetry. In order to affect the symmetry, the Ananazi infiltrate human society, spinning their own strands that connect individuals to each other and all to the Ananazi. This has resulted in the spiders spreading across the world However, most Ananazi work alone. Whatever connection exists between the Ananazi is due to a personal connection they all share with Queen Ananaza, who can communicate with each of her descendants personally. 
Broadly, the Anunnaki fall into one of three categories. Those who serve the wild, those who serve the worm, and those who serve the weaver. Another distinction between the Anunnaki and the Ovid, as they call the other pharaoh, is how they undergo the first change. For other shifters, the first change is usually sudden, dramatic, and violent. For an Anunnaki, the first change is less an event than it is a growing awareness, like a child learning to use their senses. They begin to see the great web, even as their emotions atrophy. In addition to a growth and awareness are physical changes. A budding Anunnaki develops a previously unthinkable taste for blood, in addition to unusual growths of fine but hard hairs and the occasional spasm of transformation as their spider self tries to manifest without warning until they learn to control their metamorphosis, which in turn draws the attention of other Anunnaki. For the Hamid-born Anunnaki, the adjustment of coordinating multiple limbs and engaging with multiple eyes is a challenge. For the spiderlings, the Hamid form is disconcerting in its vulnerability, to say nothing of the unusual thought processes of humans. Once the new ware spider has undergone the full change, they are taken into the Umbra for an audience with Queen Anunnaki, where they are instructed in their history, abilities, and what their role is to be in the Great Web. Every Anunnaki has their own nest where they can regain gnosis, rest, and more easily enter the umbra, called a Sili. For this place, they can clearly hear the will of Queen Anunnaki, as well as satisfy their hunger for blood and comfort in privacy. From the Sili, the Anunnaki can travel through the umbra along the Great Web to other places with little difficulty. And on the topic of blood, Anunnaki use blood where the pharaoh might use rage. In truth, their hunger for blood is more akin to that of a vampire's. Occasionally, this has brought an Anunnaki into the same circles as the leeches. However, unlike either pharaoh or vampire, the Anunnaki do not frenzy naturally, not for injury or for lack of blood. They are the grandchildren of the weaver. Their own emotions are a secondary concern to them, at best. Regardless of location or origin, all Anunnaki are of two breeds, Hamid or Arachnid. The ware spiders produce no metis and are somewhat baffled as to why such unfortunate and inefficient creatures would even be allowed to exist in the first place. A Hamid Anunnaki is indistinct from any other human until they begin their metamorphosis. By the time they complete the change, they are usually so isolated from their human family and friends that joining the Anunnaki is a welcome reprieve from having to deal with them. Arachnid-born Anunnaki must gather the necessary mass to undergo metamorphosis. They do this by spending many months cannibalizing other spiders, beginning with their brothers and sisters from the same egg sac, then anything that can be killed and eaten. This gives the arachnid more willpower and gnosis than a homid, but also a more alien and detached outlook on things. In keeping with the symmetry, the Anunnaki possess one of three aspects, according to the triad member they serve. The Teneri are those who serve the grandmother spider, the weaver. They see patterns in all things and prefer orderly, tidy relations, logical, precise thinking, and stability in the world and their daily lives. The Hatar are the servants of the worm of balance, not the worm of corruption. Ultimately, the Hatar wish to free the worm, but until it can be cleansed of its madness, the Hatar must destroy on its behalf and at the command of Queen Ananaza. The Komoti are those who serve the wild, seeking to make subtle rather than catastrophic changes and additions to the Great Web, and by doing so, combat the mad weaver stagnation and the corrupt worm's entropy. Each aspect in turn has three internal factions, the Myrmidons, the warriors of the aspect, the Viskir, the judges and truth seekers of the aspect, and the Wirsta, the mediators and questioners of the aspect. The Anunnaki possess four forms, each with its own uses. Obviously, a homid form with some slight differences from a normal human. The Anunnaki circulatory system is unique as their blood accommodates both iron-based hemoglobin and copper-based hemocyanin. Should an Anunnaki be injured in homid form, their blood might appear more orange or blue than a normal human's. On the respiratory side, an Anunnaki has the combination of pulmonary lungs, trachea, and book lungs. 
What all of this anatomical gibberish should translate to is that an Anunnaki is less likely to die from blood loss or suffocation than a human. More visibly, a Hamid Anunnaki has vesticle fangs or pedipalps in their mouths. For those unfamiliar with arachnid anatomy, pedipalps are those adorable antenna legs that stick out of a spider's face, right before you get to the teeth. The Lilian form is the human arachnid combat form. To pretty much anything, this form is unsettling. Other pharaoh may be bigger and badder, but the Lilian form varies between Anunnaki. Generally, the were spider grows an exoskeleton, possibly extra limbs, and a carapace. Basically, think of the most horrific combinations of human and spider, make it about six to eight feet tall, add teeth and claws, and you're finished. What's more, the Anunnaki can fine-tune their Lilian form through spider cannibalism, gaining or diminishing traits according to what kind of spider they've eaten in the past. The Pythus form is nothing more or less than a giant fuck-off spider about one and a half times the size of the Anunnaki's Hamid form. You know that weird guy you decided to pick a fight with in the empty parking lot with no witnesses or cameras? Well now he's a 270 pound brown recluse spider. Have fun. Internally, the pithis includes some human organs, but it's largely a big ass spider with webs approximately the same tensile strength as steel. The crawling form is not so much a form as it is the Anunnaki breaking down into hundreds or thousands of normal spiders a swarm equal in mass to the Anunnaki's Hamid form. In this form, the crawlings can enter the umbra through the great web, a happy little mass of spiders running through the universe to places and parts unknown. However, some crawlings are leaders and others followers. Leaders possess more of the Anunnaki's consciousness and personality. Killing some of the crawlings can result in a loss of memories for the Anunnaki. Losing more than 30% of the crawl links can radically change the appearance and persona of a were spider. However, if even one crawler link remains, the Anunnaki can reconstitute itself after a sufficient amount of spider cannibalism. Crawler links themselves do not provoke the delirium in mortals, but seeing an Anunnaki shift into crawler link form certainly will. The Bastet The Bastet were not the first of the changing breeds. Indeed, Gaia had passed over Cat when she began creating the shifters. This suited Cat just fine, as he preferred solitude, sleeping during the day and hunting at night. Gaia created her many champions to defend her from the Triad, from Raja, the Ensnarer, Kalash, the Destroyer, and Nala, the Changer. Gaia saw that all was well and turned her attention to other things. But when she looked back, wouldn't you guess it, everything was screwed up. But the Garu naturally were screwing up worst of all. So Gaia found Cat once more, laying in the sun and dreaming about how good he had it at life. Gaia needed his help, and he decided he would help her. Together they first created Bagheera, the leopard. She was Cat's eldest child and could do all things the pharaoh could, but she did not exceed them in their strengths. She was made to be a lawgiver, adjudicator, and executioner. But there were some places that the proud and powerful Bagheera refused to go. So Gaia and Cat tried again, creating Qualmi, the lynx, who spurred the pharaoh to consider more than just battles and pride. If Coyote was Gaia's laughter, then Qualmi was her conscience, driving others mad with their riddles. Then came Balam, the jaguar, fury given form, mightier than Bagheera, who would go where even the bravest pharaoh feared to tread, to tear out the hearts of the worm spawn. After Balam were the brothers, Swara the cheetah and Pumonka the puma. They raced each other across the face of Gaia and through the Umbra, evenly matched, delivering news and knowledge to their brothers and sisters wherever they might be found. But as Kalash the Unmaker thrashed in his torment, Gaia and Cat produced yet another child, Khan the tiger, the mighty warrior who could lay mountains low beneath his claws. When raw power did not serve Kalash, he resorted to subterfuge and lies, so Gaia created Bubasti, the Kaifer Cat, a magician who walked among humans to inoculate them against the worm's treachery. And so the children of Cat and Gaia were seven, as proud as they were beautiful. But Gaia had already seen what pride did to her other children, so she gave Cat one more child, who would be the most beautiful and regal of them all, and in doing so, humbled the rest of Cat's children. 
The youngest child of Cat was Simba, the lion, who had the very heart of a king. His majesty was only matched by his indomitable will. No foe could cow him, and no enemy could best him, and no challenge could turn him aside. The other children of Cat saw Simba and were humbled, a reminder that they existed to do their duty to Gaia, and not for their own sake. This is how the Bastet were born. But the other pharaohs saw the Bastet as an insult to them. Jealousy and suspicion filled them. They feared that the Bastet had been created to replace them, rather than support them. Indeed, what did it say about Gaia's confidence in them that she had created the Bastet in the first place? Rather than seek Gaia's wisdom on the matter, they chose to shun the Bastet. And the Bastet, being proud creatures themselves, chose to turn their backs on the pharaoh and act according to the tasks they had been assigned, to render no aid to Gaia's other children until they learned to treat the Bastet with the respect they deserved. The Garu, with their pretensions of ruling the other pharaoh, reacted as the listeners of this channel can likely predict. The Garu succeeded in driving most of the Bastet of Europe and North America to near extinction. Elsewhere, the wolves lacked the numbers or strength to harm the Bastet, but it did wonders to increase the Bastet's spite for the Garu. And if cats are good at nothing else, it's holding a grudge. Because the Bastet are wise and elegant creatures, as any cat owner will tell you, they understand, as a matter of logic, that the Garu of today are not the Garu of antiquity, that only fools hold descendants responsible for the crimes of their ancestors, and that for the sake of Gaia, who is slowly dying even now, only the combined efforts of the Bastet, the Garu, and the other pharaoh can save her from the worm. That doesn't change the fact that on an instinctive level, most Bastets simply cannot stand the Garu and would like to kill them if they could. Yet peace, however tense, has been demonstrated as possible. In Asia, the werewolves of the Hakan and recently the stargazers play an honored, if subordinate, role in the beast courts of the Emerald Mother. In Africa, the Ajaba Kisasi and the Bagheera elder Kiva have managed to knit together the Bastet, the Kuchi Kundu branch of the Red Talons tribe, the Silent Striders, and the Mokole into the Ahadi a confederation of shape-changers united against the mighty Simba King Blacktooth. Even Golgul Fangs first made entreaties of peace to Black Claw, the Balam Elder, for his support in the Amazon War. The question that faces the Bastet is whether they can set aside their own pride if the Gauru are willing to humble themselves and finally ask them for help, as Gaia intended. What the Bastets share in common with the Gauru is that they breed in similar fashion. Bastet may be human-born homids, cat-born felines, or metis. That being said, felines are rarer than homids, and metis rarest of all. However, the Bastet metis do not suffer from the same social prejudices as their Garu counterparts. After all, the Bastet tend to be solitary creatures, so consider holding another Bastet parentage against them as a waste of time. The Bastet are not creatures of Luna like the Garu. They do not have auspices, nor can they step sideways into the umbra without gifts. Instead, the Bastet have what they call prios, which indicates their personality and subtly influences it. A Bastet's prio is linked to the time of day when they underwent their first change. A Bastet of the daylight prio is forthright, open, and optimistic. They would rather meet a challenge head-on and win with courage and honor than with subterfuge. A twilight prio bastet is a creature of mystery and magic. They see everything as shades of gray, and exceptions to rules rather than rules themselves. They are more likely to want to untangle a mystery or create something that stirs the emotions. The night prio bastet are the most solitary of the werecats. They tend to be equally disciplined and deceptive, territorial and temperamental. They prefer to guard what is theirs above all other things. Like other pharaoh, the Bastet have five forms. The Hamid form is indistinguishable from any other human, though they do tend to be a bit more lithe and feline than the others. The Sokto form is their near-human form, taller, longer-limbed, with claws on the tips of their fingers, coarse body hair, extended teeth, and short whiskers. The Sokto form is clearly not human, except under cover of darkness. The Krinos war form is a large mixture of cat and human. The Chatro form appears to be a large primordial cat or great cat with teeth that border on the saber tooth. 
Interestingly, the Chatro form is the largest of the Bastet's forms, even more so than the Krinos war form, and invokes the full terror of the delirium, as this was the Bastet's preferred shape when carrying out the Impergium. The feline form resembles whatever the Bastet's nearest feline kin is. The Corax. According to the Were Ravens, they are the youngest of the Pharaoh and make no secret of the fact that they were created to spy on everyone and to tell on everybody. Gaia made them as good at finding secrets as they are bad at keeping them. In fact, the Corax believe Gaia built them with a compulsion to spread gossip. Based birds believing that information wants to be free. Sometimes it just needs a little help. The Corax also believe that they used to have white feathers, but now have black feathers because they pissed off Helios and tricked him into shining when he really didn't want to. The Corax excel at the Whisper game, and while a Corax is a supernatural monster, they weren't built for a straight up fight, not like the Gauru or Gural. A Corax sneaks whenever possible, runs whenever discovered, and fights only when sneaking and running are off the table. The Corax, unlike other Pharah, did not suffer as much of the Garu's wrath during the War of Rage, mainly because the Korax have always presented themselves to the Garu as annoying but ultimately harmless gossips and tricksters. In fact, the biggest struggle the Korax have with the Garu is getting them to pull their heads from their hairy asses and listen when there is a horde of Fomori coming down out of the hills. I mentioned that Helios and the Korax had an encounter in the past. Well, somewhere along the way, Korax came into Helios' service rather than Luna's. So in addition to the majority of their gifts coming from the sun rather than the moon, the were-ravens also have a vulnerability to gold rather than silver. Being a Korax is pretty much a free-for-all. Every raven does their own thing, but they are also sociable creatures. There is no better place to swap information than in a Korax gather. The problem is that the Korax are as allergic to organization as they are to gold. A gang of four Korax will come up with four different opinions, with some joker floating a fifth opinion just to get a rise out of the newbie. Associations of Korax are temporary, and they all know it. As they get older, they follow their own interests to every corner of the world, or the Umbra. I've already said the Korax were created for espionage rather than combat, and with that in mind, the Korax have a little, let's say trick, for gaining intelligence from either the unwilling or the dead and that is sticking their beaks into someone's eyes and sucking out the fluid to capture a glimpse of the last 60 seconds of that person's life. Think of it as picking through someone's trash, just a little more squishy. As hard as it is to believe, there are downsides to being a Korax. The first two you already know, gold and the inability of any Korax to just shut the hell up. The third is that the Korax love shiny stuff. Whether it's stray dimes, jewels, or even a piece of tinfoil, a Korax takes notice. Unfortunately for them, certain agents of the worm are as aware of this weakness as the Korax and use it to set up the were-ravens for ambush. A Korax who aspires to live a long life learns not to give in to the siren song of the shiny. There are only two breeds of Korax, Homids and Corvids. No medicine the birdhouse. Unlike some other pharaoh, the Korax don't much care if you were born with wings or not. They're all the same color in the end. Besides that, creating a Korax is a conscious act, specifically through the rite of the spirit egg. Whether you are man or bird, the spirit egg is hidden in the umbra and attached to the developing Korax's own soul. When the spirit egg hatches in the umbra, boom, a new baby Korax is born. And while two Korax certainly can get it on and even breed, the right of the spirit egg doesn't work on these pairings. A Corvid Korax's spirit egg hatches after about 8 to 10 months. The new Korax then has a normal human lifespan, though if they want to fit in with the monkeys, they have to learn a few things like reading, writing, social cues, and the finer points of personal property. Hamid Korax have to go through all of the wonders of human puberty before they get the prize. Most of these grow up a bit obsessive-compulsive and tend to have an angular, gangly look to them. They fidget a lot and find it hard to sit still. Where their corvid cousins have to learn how to act human, the hamids have to learn how to act bird, especially when it comes to flying. As you might have guessed, Gaia was going for peak efficiency when she made the Korax, so they have only three forms, Hamid, 
Prinos and Corvid. The hominid form is human but with a few small distinctions. First, most Koraks have black hair and black eyes. Not universal, but the norm. They also tend to be thin to the point of looking emaciated. The biggest tell a Corax has in hominid form is that their ring fingers are longer than their middle fingers, which is supposed to be the tell for a werewolf, but whatever. The corvid form is that of the raven form, specifically a raven with a four and a half foot wingspan. The crinos form is the cross between a raven and a human, except with strange wing arms and claws at the end. Many Korax think the crinos form just looks plain silly and will only enter it when they have no other option, though the claws do considerable damage. The Korax are a well-traveled breed of shifters. While they don't have any tribes or clans or packs or any of that other silly shit, they do have local customs that visitors should respect. The Leshy are Russian-born Korax, three quarters of which are Corvid-born and paranoid as hell, hiding in the woods like a bunch of Ted Kaczynskis. But once they start talking, they can go on for a long, long time. The gulls of battle are Scandinavian Korax who all think they are sitting right on Odin's right and left shoulders, like Hugin and Munin. Calling them seagulls is a good way to pick a fight with them, though. The name is what they are called in Norse poetry, so that's what they go with. The Tulugak are the Korax of the Pure Lands. Their name is Inuit, but they all go by that name. While they put on the front of being cool, stone-faced keepers of the fire, they also steal your stuff and fly away cackling. These guys have been friends with the Nuisha for a long time. And the two biggest tricksters in Native American lore are Coyote and Raven, so there you go. Considering some of the tricks they played on each other, you'd think the Nuisha and the Tulagak would be fighting one another to the death. But the Tulagak are also pretty tight-lipped until you win their trust. If you learn how they think, and can give and take a practical joke, the icy exteriors melt and they are just like any other Korax. The Gural The werebears claim that they were either the first shape changers created by Gaia, or that they were made from Gaia's heart. Regardless of origin, the bears believe that it was Gaia who created the triad, the yarn spinner, the tapestry maker, and the pattern breaker. Together they created existence and gave everything its appointed place. But then the tapestry maker went mad and trapped the pattern breaker, an act that has wreaked havoc on reality. So Gaia created the changing breeds. She created the Gural as her first protectors against the deranged, ceaseless thrashing of the Pattern Breaker. The Gural were powerful, but the Pattern Breaker's destruction was in time too great to contain. So the Gural begged Gaia for assistance. Gaia answered by creating the werewolves, the Garu. For a time, the protectors and warriors of Gaia were harmonious. The bears regarded the wolves as younger siblings, teaching and guiding them. The Gural also taught humans agriculture and preservation, in exchange for humans showing respect to bears. But the Garu grew resentful of the Gural. The werebears had taught the Garu many things, but not all that the werebears knew. One gift that the Gural kept secret for only their kind was the power to restore the dead to life. The Garu wanted to restore their greatest warriors to life to continue tearing at the pattern breaker. But the first great council of the Gural decided that they would keep the right to themselves in order to protect the cycle of life and death. The Garu were enraged at the Gural's obstinance and slandered the bears to the other pharaoh, claiming that they hoarded Gaia's gifts for themselves and that they had fallen to the worm. When the time of the great ice arrived, many Gural crossed the bridge into the Pure Lands with those Garu who would become the Wendigo, the Uktena, and the Croatan. In the Pure Lands, the wolves and bears remained harmonious and their kinfolk lived mostly in peace. But in Eurasia, the Gural fought the war of rage against all who sought to destroy them. Entire tribes of werebears were brought low by the pack tactics of the Garu. Those who were taken alive were tortured to death to force them to give up the right of rebirth. But not a single Gural who knew the right revealed the secret, regardless of what the wolves did to them. Eventually, the Gural realized the War of Rage was not a war for power, but of extermination. So they went into hiding, some going into hibernation in umbral glades, others giving up flesh to seek the summer lands. Eventually, the wolves believed that the bears were gone. 
Only the great-grandfather and great-grandmother remained to watch the world. When the worm breakers invaded the pure lands, the Gural awoke in numbers, but remained in hiding. They finally emerged when the Croatans sacrificed themselves to throw back the aspect of the worm called the Eater of Souls. And when the Storm Eater rampaged across the American West, the Gural finally revealed themselves to the Garu and offered aid in fighting the monstrous Worm Weaver spirit. Since their return, the Gural have anxiously sought their remaining kinfolk and worked to restore their numbers in anticipation of the final battle. This is difficult because the Gural, like their bare kin, are solitary creatures. They do form bands to combat enemies one could not fight alone, or an elder bear gathers several younger shape changers under their guidance until they are strong enough to protect territory on their own. The Ice Stalkers commonly share territory and travel in packs. When a Gural undergoes their first change, they are summoned by another Gural through dreams and waking visions, who becomes the Gural Cub's Burijan, or teacher. The teacher and student then go on a long journey, usually about a year, during which time the teacher instructs and the protege learns and questions. This is followed by a quest, taken alone, called a gallivant, when the Gural Cub is sent on a mission for the good of Gaia. Aside from the Burijan, Gural have several gatherings annually. A fest is when two Gural meet, exchanging news and gifts, and depending on the time and geography, a friendly salmon hunting competition. Regalias take place at the start of spring, when Gural gather to deal with tribal matters and local issues. The culmination of Regalia is the Dance of Creation. A powwow occurs during the summer and is an intertribal affair, a chance to meet distant strangers and show off their crafts, as well as stay abreast of matters affecting other tribes. The Council of Autumn, or the Great Council, is a solemn elaborate gathering of nearly all Gural, where rites of cleansing are performed and the tribes must appear from their respective direction they protect. The Ice Stalkers arrive from the north, the Forest Keepers from the east, the River Keepers from the south, and the Mountain Guardians from the west. The elders of the Gural meet to decide matters concerning all Gural, adjudicate disputes, and formally recognize new Gural cubs, who then perform the dance of the centuries, the only time when bears of all tribes dance together as one. Each day, a different tribe hosts a feast for the attendees. Meeting the Great One is the rarest and most dire of Gural gatherings, when the four ancient ones of the Gural summon the bears, even those in hibernation, to defend their breed, or Gaia herself, from an imminent danger. As Gaia's original protectors, the Gural are quite fearsome in battle. Singly, a Gaur would likely stand no chance against one of the werebears, and even a Khan or Simba would find themselves sorely tested. Where the Gauru use their rage to make themselves faster, the Gural's rage makes them stronger and tougher in every form, not just Krinos. However, the Gural, being slower to anger, regain rage slower as well. A Gural falling into the thrall of the worm is practically unheard of. Like the Korax, the Gural breed purposefully and therefore produce no metis. Even if two Gural were to attempt to breed, no child would be born of their union. So there are only two breeds of Gural, the human-born Hamids and the bear-born Ursine. Though still few in number, the Hamid Gural have expanded since the werebear's return. To produce more kinfolk, the Gural have tried to breed with people in the medical profession or conservationists. To the bear-born Ursine, Gural have been slower to return, especially when their kinfolk are endangered but most are born in national parks. Ursine Gural are quite curious about their human cousins and want to learn from them about the hairless ones. The auspices of the Gural are similar to that of the Garu. However, a Gural spends a portion of their life in each of the five auspices of their breed before settling on one, according to their personality and geography. And a Gural may learn the gifts of any auspice they are or were under. The werebears named the new moon as Arcus, which is where they begin their gallivant. This resembles the Ragabash auspice of the Garu, and it ends when a Gural battles their first enemy without the aid of their Burijan. Following this experience, they progress to Uzmati, the full moon. The Uzmati learned more of their role as a warrior and protector of Gaia. Some bears spend years in this auspice, others only months or even weeks. 
This auspice corresponds with the Arun auspice of the Garu, and it ends when a Gural finds a mate, or decides to settle into their own territory. They change auspice to Kojubat, the gibbous moon, when a Gural dedicates time to the study of their breed's lore, songs, dances, and history. This is when their life work begins, creating art or crafts of their own, using their knowledge to produce something worth remembering. This period of life corresponds to the Galliard auspice of the Garu, and it ends when a Gural turns their minds inward to the spirit side of their being. They pass into the Kie auspice, the crescent moon. At this stage, a Gural's mystic power grows exponentially, mastering new gifts and rites, and deepening their knowledge of the Umbra. This auspice corresponds to the Theurge auspice of the Garu. During this time, a werebear often serves as a Burijan to a newly changed cub and takes them on their journey. The last stage in the Gural's natural progression is Rishi, the Half Moon. The Rishi uses all of their accumulated knowledge and experience to guide their fellow Gural along the correct paths and keep the peace. By this time, a Gural is usually ready to be considered an elder of the breed and possibly a tribal leader. This auspice corresponds to the Philodox auspice of the Garu. All Gural are part of the four major tribes of the world, corresponding to the four directions and four seasons. Once there was a fifth, the Okuma of Japan and East Asia, who were destroyed in the War of Shame. The Forest Walkers tribe resides in North America and claims the Black Bears as their Ursine kinfolk. The Ice Stalkers dwell in Alaska, the northern parts of Canada, and the tundra of Russia maintaining a healthy respect and a healthier distance from the Wendigo. The Ice Stalkers' kinfolk are, naturally, polar bears. The Mountain Guardians maintain the Rocky Mountain region as their territory. They have fairly positive relations with the Pure Tribes and the Bastet thanks to their role in fighting the Storm Eater. Their kinfolk are grizzly bears. And last but not least are the River Keepers, once widespread but now existing mostly in the riverlands of Alaska, Russia, and the Pacific Northwest. The river keepers' bear kin are of several kind, brown bears, sloth bears, moon bears, sun bears, and spectacled bears. Finally, the Gural have five forms. The hominid form is indistinct from any other human, though they usually have some of the coloring of their bear form in their hair or skin. The Arthrin form, or near man, form has done a great deal to spread myths about Bigfoots and Yetis. The Krinos war form of a Gural is usually the last sight of those who see it, a one-ton tower of fur, hide, muscle, and claw, with a hide that is impenetrable to most firearms. The Bjornin form, or near bear form, is nothing less than a monstrous bear that vaguely resembles modern species of their kind. The Ursus form is the full bear shape of the Gural. The Kitsune in Asia, before the Wanjian were cursed to become the Wan Kuei, they deceived and manipulated the Hange Yokai to slaughter one another, so that the corrupted immortals could seize the Hange Yokai's dragon nests as their own. This event was later called the War of Shame. But as the blood of the shapeshifters fell like rain, along with Gaia's tears, the greatest and cleverest fox to ever live, Bai Mian Shi, the white-faced one, dwelled in the Middle Kingdom, hunting and hiding as she willed. In time, she taught other foxes the skills and wisdom that she had learned, and played tricks not only on mortals, but changing breeds, little gods, lightning men, and even the Wanjian. In time, Bai Mianji wed Prince Inari, a mighty spirit of cunning, benevolence, and justice, a protector of kits and children. But one day, Luna carried Bai Mianji away from her skulk to the courts of the Emerald Mother, or rather, Gaia. Gaia required the first of the Kitsune to serve her, but Bai Mianji loved freedom too much to be bound into eternal servitude for herself and her people. She used every trick and subterfuge she knew to get out of it. She offered the Emerald Mother news she had never heard, wagered for her freedom, a wager in which she intended to cheat, and offered single combat against one of Gaia's champions. But Gaia rejected every one of Bai Mianji's proposals, all that Bai Mianji knew, Gaia already heard. Others had tried to cheat her before and failed, and any champion of Gaia could destroy the little fox in combat. 
Bai Mianji, now truly desperate, raised her tear-filled eyes to the Emerald Mother and asked if Gaia knew so much and had such capable servants already, what need did she have of a little fox who only wanted to hunt and play? Gaia, in her fury, nearly destroyed Bai Mianji on the spot, but Luna knew that the fox's heart was pure and interceded to save her. When the Emerald Mother's rage subsided, Gaia made three promises to Bai Mianji for her service. First, one day, the Kitsune would be greater than any of Gaia's other servants in something. Second, that the Kitsune would survive the sixth age when other, mightier changing breeds were destroyed. And third, in the last age of the world, Gaia would release the Kitsune from her service, and they would be free once more to do as they wished. For one year, Bai Mianji learned what was expected of her in her secret powers that she would need to serve Gaia. When she returned to the Middle Kingdom, her court was in ruins, and her husband, Prince Inari, had disappeared. She searched for Prince Inari in every corner of the Middle Kingdom, and saw the devastation that the War of Shame had inflicted on mortals and shapeshifters alike. When she accepted that her love had gone from the world, she then asked Gaia what to do. The Silver Lady instructed Bai Mianji to destroy those nations that no longer enjoyed the Mandate of Heaven, including those supported by the Wan Jian. Bai Mianji reformed her court of foxes and used the gifts Gaia bestowed on her to make the wisest and cleverest foxes into werefoxes, the Kitsune. And so the Kitsune have passed through the ages, serving the Emerald Mother by toppling Gaia's enemies through magic, subterfuge, and wits. For the Kitsune, the coming of the Sixth Age holds less terror than it does for the other Hange Yokai. They remember Gaia's promise to buy Mianji. The Kitsune rarely meet in any number. They are too busy doing Gaia's work for pompous gatherings or rituals. But when they do meet, it is usually tied to some auspicious number, such as one, two, or four. When it comes to the beast courts, a Kitsune's loyalty is always to breed first and courts a distant second. Only a quarter follow the way of emerald virtue, and even those only serve the courts temporarily. For a Kitsune to be born, someone else must die. Many Kitsune come into the world missing one or both of their parents. As they pass through life, few Kitsune mate permanently, despite wanting love and feeling every lost loved one for their long lives. Some Kitsune choose to keep others at arm's length, since mating will most likely result in their companion's death. Still, the Kitsune care deeply for their kinfolk, and will take extraordinary efforts to protect them. The Kitsune are distinct from the more notable Garu in several ways. First, they are not creatures of war. Unlike the Garu, the werefoxes do not regenerate without the use of healing magic. As creations of the Fourth Age, the Kitsune had no hand in the Empergium, so their Krinos form does not provoke the Delirium. In exchange for this, Silver is no bane to the foxes, and they may learn not only the gifts unique to their breed, but those of other shapeshifters as well with great ease. Additionally, Kitsune live for a very long time. As they age and gain power, Kitsune gain additional tails, which doubles their lifespan with every single tail. Only one nine-tailed fox has ever been known to exist, Bai Mianji, who is effectively immortal. The Kitsune follow the well-known three breeds of other shapeshifters. The Kojin are the human-born werefoxes. The Roko are the fox-born. The Shinju are the Kitsune Metis. Among other foxes, such children are considered auspicious. They are not deformed as with other breeds, though a pairing of two foxes rarely produces a Shinju. Most of the time, the two Kitsune will create a human or a fox. Tragically, one of the Shinju's parents is destined to die in order to bring them into the world. Unlike other changing breeds, the Kitsune do not have auspices. Rather, when they reach the age when they are prepared to become no Kitsune, a fox without rank, they are given the right of the crossroads. The right reveals a Kitsune's nature and calling. Unlike the traditional familiar four elements, Kitsune elements represent certain blended elements, specifically Nindo, or clay, the union of earth and water, Kiri, or fog, the union of water and air, Inazuma, or lightning, the union of air and fire, 
and yogan, or lava, the union of fire and earth. A kitsune on the path of Nindo is called a kataribe. Their calling is the creation of things and the compilation of lore, which is fitting as clay is often used in the making of pots and was used in the creation of tablets and talismans before the invention of paper. Given their knowledgeable and useful ways, most of the kitsune in service to the beast courts are kataribe, often serving as diplomats to the other shin. A kitsune on the path of kiri is called a gukusushi. The dream weavers simultaneously heal and trick, and they seek to both save lives and humble those in need of a lesson. The gukutsushi are masters of magic that can either sharpen or dull the mind. A kitsune on the path of Inazuma is called a doshi. The doshi, or sorcerers, are all noted to have a hint of darkness in them, as they believe in turning the tools of evil to Gaia's use. To that end, they learn to enslave demons of Yomi into their service. A kitsune on the path of Yogan is called an Eiji. They are the closest thing to warriors that the kitsune have, though they are more akin to knights errant or assassins. They are able to battle Bane spirits, Fomori, and even Kuei Jin when the need arises. As with other breeds, the kitsune shapeshift through five forms. They are nowhere near suited for combat as a Garu, a Gural, or a Khan, but the Werefoxes are prouder of the elegance of their forms than their lethality. Interestingly, a kitsune's tail, or tails, may manifest in any of their five forms. The kitsune Hamid form is known as Hitogata. A kitsune in this shape does not appear to be different from any other human, though many kitsune often tend to have a hint of mischief in their eyes, no matter how serious they may be. The kitsune glabro form is called Sambuhenge, and is nearly identical to the Hitogata form, save for sharply pointed ears, vertical pupils, whiskers, and a bushy tail. The koto form is the kitsune's crino shape. Overall, the koto appears to be a human-sized bipedal fox with human hands. This form's only real advantage in combat is the addition of vulpine teeth. The juko form is a kitsune's great fox form, essentially a fox the size of a wolf. Some kitsune practice using weapons in this form, usually single-handed weapons, like a knife held in their teeth. The Kyubi form is a kitsune's true fox form. Most kitsune are descended from red fox kinfolk, but there are some gray fox kitsune as well. The Mokole. It is well known that once upon a time, dinosaurs roamed the earth, along with stranger creatures lost to history. The firstborn of Gaia were the mysterious creatures now known only as the lizard kings to their descendants, the reptilian shape changers, the Mokole. The Mokole serve as Gaia's memory. They can remember a world before humans, before the other changing breeds. Indeed, the Mokole carry the knowledge of eons in their blood. As the number of Garu dwindle, the Mokole emerge from rivers and tributaries. Only they and the oldest spirits recall the age of the Lizard Kings. They were shapeshifters, but they had no human forms, as there were no humans at the time. However, they constructed tools in cities of their own. The Mokole remember thousands of creatures lost to the world and hundreds of forms their ancestors once took. Originally, the Mokole had three forms, the Divisor, the Dissolver, and the Designer, each aligned with one aspect of the Triad. Gaia was much more energetic when the world was still hot and malleable, so the Lizard Kings waged war against one another to prove the superiority of their particular form over others until the Age of Sleep fell on them. No Mokole remembers the Age of the Lizard Kings perfectly, nor why it ended. Gaia turned her attention and favor from the Lizard Kings to other pitiful proto-mammalians. Something came from the stars. The Old One screamed, perished, and then died. Then the world was no longer the Lizard Kings. From the ruin of the Age of the Lizard Kings came the other changing breeds. But the Lizard Kings survived in the form of the Mokole. Their forms were always malleable, so the Wersaurians breed with humans and eventually were able to take the shape of men. When the War of Rage came, the last of the mighty Wersaurians were slain by the Garu, as they were larger targets for the claws and fangs of Gaia. But the Mokole who assumed more humble shapes 
that of smaller reptiles were able to hide from the Garu. To this very day, the Mokale bitterly lament that if the Pharaoh had united against the wolves, the War of Rage would have ended much differently. And the Garu proved themselves terrible stewards of both Gaia and of mankind. Once, men worshipped the Mokale as dragons and gods. Now humans cover the earth in unchecked numbers. The Garu await the apocalypse with trepidation, but for the Mokale, it will simply be the end of another epoch, and when the human world ends, the dragons will reawaken from their long dream and rule the earth once more. The Mokale have bided their time and rebuilt their numbers, albeit in humbler circumstances. They are likely to be found in places where humans and large reptiles can share living space, called wallows. These spaces are most likely to be found in the American Gulf Coast, large sections of African riverlands and marshlands, parts of southern India, southeast Asia, and northern Australia. In some wallows, the Mokale never take their homid form or interact with human society, except to occasionally partake of some human meat. Clans of Mokale are known as clutches, and usually its members are closely related. Feuding clutches can fight for generations, though rarely to the death. Again, the Mokale are mindful of their numbers. If the Mokale rarely interact with humans, they are especially cautious in their dealings with other shape changers. Usually these encounters are meticulously planned and take place far away from the Mokole's breeding grounds. The number of times a Mokale has revealed themselves to a Garu can probably be counted on one hand. For the Mokale, the War of Rage is an especially vivid and hateful memory, though younger Wersaurian's dragon dream compels them to enter the world and move destiny with their own hands. Or Claws All Mokale speak a common language known as Lingua Draconis, or the Dragon Tongue. As creatures of both sun and moon, the Mokale are vulnerable to gold and silver. Unlike the Garu, the Mokale cannot inherently step sideways into the Umbra and must use gifts and spirit paths to navigate the realms. Some Mokale mystics speak of umbral realms where the reign of the Lizard Kings never ended and the great reptilian tyrants still rule. The Mokale are creatures of memory and dreams. For a Mokale to even be born, they must essentially dream themselves into existence. Hamid Mokale come from many walks of life and have a way of knowing things they should not be able to. As they grow older, they are afflicted by strange primordial dreams until their first change. The Sukid are the reptile-born Mokale and bring with them reptilian thought processes. They tend to be patient to the point of lethargy, only to explode with the occasional bout of wrath or lust. There are no metis Mokale. Even when two Mokale unknowingly or knowingly mate, their offspring will usually die stillborn or unhatched. The modern Mokale are isolated from one another, however they may be categorized into four streams based on their customs and geography. The Mokole Membe are the largest of the four streams and known as the stream of fighters. They most often take the Sukid or animal form of alligators, crocodiles, caimans, or gila monsters. The Gungan are known as the stream of the forerunners. In addition to their great mastery of Nisus, the ancestral memory of the Mokale, they are the only Wersaurians who can enter the Umbra. Their most common Sukid forms are that of the saltwater crocodile or the Parity monitor. The Makara are the stream of the folk and are heavily influential in Indian society, including in matters of religion, politics, and caste. The Makara often take the form of gavials, mugger and saltwater crocodiles. Finally, the Zhonglung are the stream of the philosophers. They have long ties with the beast courts of the Emerald Mother and so have the fewest memories of conflict with the Garu. They are also the most scholarly of the Mokale and have taken to recording certain niece's memories onto paper. Their Sukut forms are typically Chinese alligators, saltwater crocodiles, and monitor lizards. All Mokale possess only three forms, the Hamid form, the Arkid form, and the Sukid form. A Mokale's Hamid form is dependent on the stream into which they were born, but they are almost always found in some warm, humid climate. The Mokale Membe are found in Africa and the southern United States. 
The Gungan are usually Pacific Islanders or Australians. The Makara are usually of Indian extraction. The Zhonglong are usually East Asian. The Mokale Arkid form is not a war form per se. Rather, it is the Mokale as he dreams himself into being, usually with a combination of Saurian traits taken from Nisus into a wondrous or horrifying creature, most often described as a mixture of dinosaur, dragon, and leviathan. The Sukut form is their reptilian form. Every stream has several Sukut forms called Varna, which is why different species of reptiles can be members of the same stream. The Naga Most changing breeds have some stories about one of the strangest of Gaia's creatures, the Were Serpents. They are remembered as lithe and treacherous, given to ritualistic dance and ritualistic murder. Most believe they were one of the pharaoh driven to extinction in the War of Rage, but the Naga endured and continued their work as Gaia's holy executioners and keepers of secrets. The Naga kept their own secrets so well that it is impossible to say how many now exist in the world, having concealed themselves in the shadows of human civilization. But they never forgot their duty to pass judgment on Gaia's children who strayed from her wisdom. The Ware Serpents were never well loved for these secret judgments. In one such case, a Naga assassin named Venata provoked the War of Rage by murdering a prince of the Silver Fangs. But as the War of Rage consumed the Pharaoh, the Naga withdrew into their Ananta, their umbral den realms beneath the rivers and grottoes, and waited. Wolves may be ferocious killers, but they are impatient. Eventually their rage cooled and their memories faded. Meanwhile, the Naga strengthened their allegiance to the Lu Lung, the great dragon spirits of Ji Wang Chi realm. And in this age of great injustice, more Naga emerged to deliver sharp corrections, usually at the point of their poisoned fangs. The Naga believe that Gaia has two faces, one being the Emerald Mother, the nurturing, protective, and creative aspect of the great earth spirit, and Devi, the face of wrath, destruction, and vengeance. Where the Garu charge into the maw of the worm, the Naga strike at its servants in darkness, along with all who threaten Gaia. And while the Black Spiral Dancers are certainly worthy of destruction, Gaia has more treacherous enemies whose crimes are not as obvious. The Naga prefer to kill quietly, quickly, and to remove all evidence of their presence. A few even dispose of the corpses of their victims. Some targets of the Naga are so infamous that the Ware Serpents elected to essentially damn them from memory by erasing all traces of their existence. Few Naga hunt alone. In fact, solo hunting is a forbidden practice. The traitor Venata acted alone and nearly ruined the Ware Serpents. Instead, the Naga work in nests of two or three serpents, effectively cells that can be activated suddenly and disappear just as quickly. A solitary Naga is essentially one who has retired from judging and execution, or one whose nest was destroyed and cannot join another. Above the nests are the Sesha, nine Naga who direct the Ware Serpents, keep the laws of Gaia, determine the punishments to be meted out, and act as messengers of the Wani. The very existence of the Sesha in their umbral realm, Nandana Ananta, is a secret to all non-Naga. The Sesha determine when a Naga is prepared to advance in rank, and they return to the physical realm four times a year, to prevent their spirits from leaving their flesh. They also take the time to survey the state of the world, and decide what targets the Naga should prioritize. The Wani are a group of ancient incarnate spirits, also known as the Dragon Kings. They direct the Naga from their own secret realm, known as Shi Wang Chi. They are the spiritual guides and guardians of the Naga race, as well as the most terrible punishers in existence. Only two beings have ever been handed over to the Wani for eternal torment, one of them being Venanta. The greatest heroes of the Naga have been briefly summoned for a spiritual audience in Shi Wang Chi and returned to the material world with powerful gifts and enlightenments. There are three breeds of Naga, the human-born Balaram, the serpent-born Vasuki, and the Metis Ahi. A Balaram is usually raised with no knowledge of their supernatural lineage until they shed the first skin, the Naga term for the first change. Many Balaram go through childhood with a fear of snakes, 
which makes the first change a bit traumatic for most of them. Vasuki Naga are reared in clutches of snakes like any other, though only one usually breeds true, and the Naga parent usually knows exactly which one will. A Vasuki shedding of the first skin is akin to a second adolescence, as they must acclimate to their new senses, limbs, and even body temperature. An Ahi is a Metis Naga, and must be born in an Ananta, or serpent waters, that is, a part of the Umbra controlled by the Naga. A Naga mother may only breed one Ahi in her lifetime. Unlike with the Garu, the Ahi are not deformed or despised. Instead, they are rare treasures, raised in both the Umbra and the material world. They are fiercely devoted to the Naga in their nests. However, they are more sensitive to the decay of the material world, especially the presence of industrial pollution. A Naga's auspice is determined by the season they were born in. The Kamakshi are the serpents of the spring. They are energetic and cultivate life, whether healing the sick or rearing children, or encouraging others. The Kamakshi also have an affinity for the element of earth. The Kartikaya are the serpents of summer. These warrior snakes are more zealous and bloodthirsty than other Naga, which sometimes causes them to disregard the Naga's preference for subtlety. The Kartikaya have an affinity for the element of fire. The Kamsa are the serpents of autumn. These snakes are calculating and introspective, preferring to study and destroy their foes with precise and methodical plans and attacks. The Kamsa have an affinity for the element of earth. And the Kali are the serpents of winter. They are motivated, direct, and ruthless as an arctic wind. They shun Machiavellian schemes in favor of clear and brutal action. The Kali have an affinity for the element of water. The Naga also possess four forms of transformation. The Balaram is the Naga term for their human form, and most are of Indian or Asian descent. However, where one may find serpents, there may also be Naga, hiding behind a calm, focused human face. The Sikaram is the form of the serpent man, a humanoid with the slitted eyes, some scales, fangs, and nostrils of a serpent. Some even have the hooded heads of cobras. The Azi Dahaka Warform is a 15 to 20 foot long serpent with humanoid chest and arms. This shape is one of the fastest and most agile pharaoh that Gaia created, in addition to possessing a venom that can slay nearly any creature who feels the Naga's bite. The Kali Dahaka form is that of the Great Serpent, larger than the legendary anacondas of the Amazon and over two feet in circumference. The Vasuki is the Naga's true snake form. In this shape, they may breed with any venomous serpent, and all Naga's Vasuki form resembles that of their closest serpent parent. The Nuisha How Coyote Created the World Coyote looms large in the tales of the Pure Lands. The humans attribute the creation of the world and all the things in it to him, along with two red-eyed ducks. Some say the coyote had the ducks drag the world up from the endless waters before time. Others say he sang his song and created everything in the world that we now know. Regardless of how he did it, coyote is the creator of all life on earth, starting with water and then ducks. For some reason, coyote really likes ducks. But nothing holds coyote's attention for very long. He created all of the birds and beasts, taught them how to procreate, then split up the great land masses into chunks. Then he wandered off to go do something else. But things came into the world that Coyote did not create. These things fell from the stars. Coyote was curious about these unusual things and asked them where they came from. These things said, We have always been, Coyote. We heard your song and came to see what you had made. Some of these creatures flew away from Luna, Gaia's sister and neighbor leaving her without life or companionship. Coyote decided to sing for Luna nightly to make amends. Some nights she listens attentively. Other nights she turns her face away entirely. How Coyote Created Man As for humans, it is said that Coyote was wandering along and saw a clot of blood in the dirt. On a whim, he kicked it and saw that it grew larger. Intrigued, he kicked it again, and again, and again, until it became a human. Coyote was slightly disturbed by this and vowed never to kick another clot. Somehow, more humans kept popping up across the face of Gaia, but Coyote wasn't interested in humans at this point. Afterwards, 
humans busily threw themselves into throwing the world off balance. Most creatures were predators, prey, or both. But humans tried to be predators as often as possible and prey as little as possible. So they drove off any creature that tried to hunt them, and whipped, bribed, and tricked some other creatures into serving them. This is why the cousins of Wolf came into humanity's service as dogs. How Coyote Created Shapeshifters Eventually, the beasts of the world desired to curb humanity's excesses by guiding them. Wolf, bear, snake, lizard, and rat, along with others, came to Coyote and asked for his permission to do so. Coyote agreed, curious to see what would happen. However, Spider was infatuated with humans and took many of them into her service. Then Brother Worm tried to creep into Spider's webs to take some of the humans for himself. Only Worm was very fat and got stuck in the webs. The more he tried to free himself, the tighter Spider's webs grew around him. Coyote laughed at Worm's predicaments, and in doing so wounded his pride. To this day, Brother Worm refuses to ask Coyote for help, even though Coyote could free him from Spider's webs easily. The humans in service to Spider learned her ways and built one city after another. The humans who followed the other beasts learned their ways and some of their gifts. The humans named themselves and their lands after their patrons, but in time, they thought themselves greater than the animals and wanted to subordinate them. The animals ran back to Coyote in confusion. Why did the humans still not think like the animals did? Coyote only shrugged and told them that they had not taught humans to think like animals, only gave them gifts without responsibilities. So the animals went to do that in their own ways. Wolf tried to claw and tear and beat humanity into line. Rat made humans sick, so they would appreciate good health and become stronger. Snake tried to teach humans so many secrets that they gave up and forgot most of them. Shark gave up on humanity entirely and disappeared into the sea. But still, humans just weren't getting the point. So the animals decided that perhaps the humans would think like animals if they could turn into animals. So the changing breeds were born, and yet more trouble came about. Every pharaoh was the master of this, the keeper of that, the guardian of such and such mystery, the king of who honestly gives a shit. Pride and vanity led them to war against each other, a war that was ostensibly won by the children of Wolf, the Garu, though in winning they lost valuable allies, some to oblivion, as well as the respect of those who survived. Meanwhile, Coyote and his children only laughed and shrugged. You see, Coyote had taught humans to change their shape long before the other animals did. Coyote gets bored easily, even with his own form. His children followed his example, changing from human to coyote and back again, all the more so they could play tricks on those they wished to. And so, despite what the other changing breeds might think, the Nuisha, the children of Coyote, were the first of the shape changers. All Nuisha revere Coyote, even though they acknowledge that he's probably not the greatest father. He's definitely a fun dad, but he's not much of a disciplinarian. Even the few rules he gives his children are pretty flexible, though stubbornly not following them might mean that Coyote has to give a Nuisha a harsh prank or two. Despite the Nuisha's reputation as Guy's laughter, their tricks and pranks must first and foremost teach a lesson, usually of the respect of Gaia and how to stop taking yourself so seriously. The only time Nuisha's pranks turn fatal is when dealing with a servant of the worm or someone who is actively destroying Gaia. Nuisha like to have room to escalate their pranks, if only so that the target has fair warning to change their ways, or else. If and when else happens, well, maybe they'll be smarter in their next life. In the end times, the Nuisha's pranks have become harsher and more likely to be lethal. Maybe Coyote is getting tired of these cloddish clots not taking the lesson. Maybe it's time for the final prank, the big one, where Coyote has the last laugh. No one knows how many Nuisha actually exist. Within the breed, it is known that only a hundred were coyotes exist on Earth at any given time. However, the Nuisha assume the rest are off doing something important in the Umbra. But the thing is, the Nuisha generally don't know what each other are up to. When a Nuisha has reached the end of their time on Earth, they are inducted into what is known as the Umbral Dance. The Umbral Dancers protect the sacred places of Coyote in the Penumbra and the Umbra from attack. 
Despite being a Native American legend, Coyote's children wander the length and breadth of the world. They are not warriors, though they are capable of defending themselves. The Ware Coyotes prefer to use their wits and luck to extricate themselves from any trouble they might find themselves in. Unlike the Garu, the Nuisha have no tribes and only one auspice. All Nuisha are of Coyote, and all are Ragabash. As to why this is, the only auspice the Nuisha can access, some say that it is because they are all tricksters. Others say that it is because Luna is still angry with Coyote. The only camp of the Nuisha are the Umbral Dancers. On the other hand, since there are more Umbral Dancers than Nuisha, it would probably be more accurate to say that the Earth Nuisha are the camp, and the Umbral Dancers are the breed. Whether human or coyote born, when a Nuisha experiences their first change, a senior Nuisha appears to mentor them, teach them their duties, the rules, some gifts, and then the mentor goes off to do whatever it was they were doing beforehand. Like I said, Coyote is not exactly a doting father, and the Nuisha don't encourage pups to think of him as such. In fact, if a were coyote gets too big of a head, Coyote might leave them without gifts at a moment in which they need them most. Speaking of Rolling Stone Papa Coyote, nearly all Nuisha follow Coyote as their totem. But Coyote wears many different masks, depending on who sees him. Chung Kui is a master of odds and chance and cheating. Nuisha who follow this mask of Coyote manipulate fate in ways most damaging to the worm. Kishi Jotun is Coyote as a healer who gives help to the suffering. Few Nuisha follow Kishi Jotun as it requires them to not play as many pranks as they might otherwise like. Loki is Coyote's warrior mask. When subtlety and humor don't work, it becomes necessary to simply beat the shit out of the offending party. Followers of Loki Nuisha sometimes work with Garu, if only because Garu respects warriors. Ogma is Coyote as the Bard. Those who follow him sing songs about stories, inspiration, and ridicule as needed to make their point. However, no Nuisha chooses Ogma. Ogma, rather, chooses Nuisha as his own followers. Pan, or Cocopelli, is Coyote the Seducer. Those who follow Pan are as lusty as they are cunning, luring some into their beds, others to their doom, and occasionally both at the same time. Pata is the mask of Coyote as the magician. Most of the Umbral dancers follow this mask. Apart from Coyote and his masks, some Nuisha follow Raven. They are watchful, inquisitive, and subtler than other wear Coyotes. They are also less lethal than their fellows. After all, if you kill someone, they can't learn anything ever again. Aside from Raven, some Nuisha follow T. Malice, the Spider Queen. Nuisha who follow T. Malice are masters of lies and subterfuge, typically with the goal of getting humans out of cities. Cut public service? No trash pickup? Constant stories about murder and human misery in the urban hive. Coyotes of the Spider Queen, ladies and gentlemen. Last is Xochipilli. Those who follow the Flower Prince are, to put it mildly, insanely brave, or bravely insane. Either way, they're insane. They take risks that no Nuisha would. Somehow, many manage to come out of the other side, sometimes unharmed, other times with singed fur and an eye towards the next suicidal mission, laughing all the while. The Nuisha have only two breeds, Hamid and Latrini. No Metis Nuisha have ever been born. In fact, the Ware Coyotes, notable among themselves, simply can't have good sex with each other. With anyone else, light the fireworks, full steam ahead, and hope the neighbors aren't home. Hamid Nuisha are usually jokesters and class clowns, or they're the kid who's just too quiet, mind wandering on another planet. Unlike the Garu, a Nuisha's first change isn't a time bomb waiting to go off. It's more like a sudden moment of awareness, and an urge, the urge to prank the world. A coyote-born Nuisha is usually curious as a pup, and they always have their nose in something they shouldn't. Their first change is due to getting into trouble that no amount of cleverness or luck can get them out of. Coyote looks down on his child and gives them a little oomph in the form of changing into an eight-foot-tall man-coyote. As to auspices, the Nuisha simply don't have them. 
as they don't have any rage. Luna has never forgiven Coyote, and that ill will extends to his offspring. However, the Nuisha do have five forms. The Hamid form you should be familiar with by now. The near man form is called Sitsu, a larger, stronger, slightly hairier version of their Hamid form. The Manabozo form is the quote-unquote war form of the Nuisha, an eight-foot-tall coyote-headed monster. While the Nuisha took no part in the Apergium, they look close enough to the Garu that the Manabozo form has a lesser form of the Delirium on witnesses. The Sinde form is the great coyote form of the Nuisha. Simply put, it is a form of coyote, about the size of a normal wolf. The Latrani form is the Nuisha's normal coyote shape. The Ratkin. The children of Rat are creatures of chaos. Chaos, however, is not evil, or at least it can be not evil. Originally, the Ratkin were the keepers of humanity, in the sense of culling the weak with disease, plague, and the occasional nocturnal purge. The Garu despised the Ratkin simply for doing their duty. They slandered them as cowards. When the werewolves tried to assert their dominance over the Ratkin, but this soon gave way to a desire to exterminate. But the Gaur of old were too powerful for the Ratkin to fight, so the Ratkin fled into the Umbra, wounded as a race, and filled with rage. In their umbral realms, the Ratkin survivors told each other that the Gaur had been seduced by the worm. The Gaur valorized their destruction of the Ratkin, even as they purged humans en masse. When humans rose up against the Impergium, the Ratkin returned from the Umbra, to resume their duties, albeit quietly. But by then, they were too weak to do what needed to be done. Man spread across the world like a cancer, and the werewolves slunk off into the shadows like the whipped dogs they were. By the close of the 21st century, humans numbered nearly six billion. They have crippled the wild in service to both the weaver and the worm, respectively. The Garu are failures. The balance must be restored by any means. What exists beyond reason? Madness. The Ratkin, long hidden underground and in the Umbra, have returned to the world, filled with both madness and hatred. Hatred for the Garu, for humanity, for the Weaver, and for the Worm. They will fall because they must. To save Gaia, the Ratkin cannot resort to half measures, only atrocities. Ratkin in the end times are a people at war with all, using every tool at their disposal. Unlike the Garu, the Ratkin actually have an army, primed and waiting for the apocalypse, the last and best chance they have to save the wild and Gaia. Wherever the Ratkin go, chaos and destruction follow in their wake. The Ratkin spur each other to greater acts of sabotage and murder. Ratkin who hold no rank gather together in a rampage. A rampage of Ratkin is unique in that they have no leader, but they do have a runt, the smallest and weakest and least accomplished member of the rampage, who the rest bully mercilessly until the runt can force another into their position. When a rampage becomes skilled enough, they gain the title of ramblers and are allowed to form a rat pack, as well as choose their own pack totem. Most Pharaoh know that rat is a totem of war, but the rat can see the other faces of the spirit. Mother Rat is a totem that cares for the ill and the young, but the maddest rats serve the incarnate known as the Rat God, the most violent aspect of Rat, which drives the Ratkin in turn towards the apocalypse. The Ratkin are more numerous than all of the other pharaoh, having spent centuries breeding and building. Their tunnels spread from the material world into the Umbra, as Ratkin colonies are led by a Rat King who is served by courtiers. These colonies are centered on sites of spiritual energy. Most ramblers and rampages avoid the Ratkin kingdoms, as such orderly places offend their desire for destruction, and Ratkin elders are eager to drive them out into the labyrinths. But even those few fair who are aware that the Ratkin still exist do not know the extent of them, or of their psychotic hunger for carnage. The Ratkins regard shapeshifting as a curse. The proof is in their own blood. Blood that carries a powerful disease that has been transmitted through thousands of years of Ratkin. This is known as the birthing plague. When a kinfolk is bitten by a Ratkin and the appropriate rite is invoked, the birthing plague is activated. 
Most die from the bite of a were-rat, but those who don't become true ratkin themselves. A Hamid ratkin goes through most of their life without any knowledge of their heritage. But those who know of the ratkin's nature understand the penchant for schoolyard brawls or acts of destruction as evidence of their nature. Those ratkins who are rodents, or rat-born, are laser-focused on their own survival. They tend to have flashes of insight, knowing where to tunnel and when to flee or attack enemies. When a rodent is infected, the madness of the bite can turn their minds and fill them with thoughts of revenge. Ratkin metis are nothing less than monstrosities, deformities that are quickly taken away by other ratkin to be raised insofar as such beings can be. Metis ratkin are usually beaten into submission until they learn that the only place they will be accepted is in the ratkin colony and their only purpose is to bring about the end of the world. This converts most Metis into fanatics for the destruction of the earth. When they are released from a colony, they are some of the most devoted destroyers that the rat totem has. The rat can possess four aspects, related to their particular form of madness granted by the birthing plague. The tunnel runners are the scouts of their kind. Their only wealth is carried on their person, and their ability to get in and out of enemy outposts or cairns is legendary. They also travel between ratkin kingdoms with news and warnings. The shadow seers are the wise rats of their kind, peering into the umber for knowledge and locating holy relics among the cast of garbage of human cities. The shadow seers are also prone to a unique brand of insanity that leads them to raptures and seizures of vision. The knife skulkers are ratkins who are equally gifted in negotiation and assassination. They, above all other ratkin, are masters of the unseen kill. They are the Ratkins' masters of contracts and obligations. When someone breaks their contracts, the Knife Skulkers eagerly enforce the punishment clauses hidden in the fine print. The Blade Slaves are the most feral and brutal of the Ratkin. They study and weaken their enemies before they strike the first, and ideally last, blow. They practice what their Nozumi counterparts call low warfare. Each blade slave carries a weapon bound with a spirit of violence which speaks to them as they swarm over their enemies. In addition to these aspects, there are four other aspects, known as freak aspects. Twitchers are more prone to frenzy and may use freak gifts to unleash greater displays of chaos and violence. The Ratkin engineers exploit the weaver to scavenge the spider's weapons and equipment for the Ratkin swarm. The Plague Lords are always cooking new and more painful biological weapons for use against mankind. The Munchmausen are psychopathic heroes who seek to prove themselves with adventures and exploits that only serve to heighten their insanity. The Rat can have three forms through which they can shift, Hamid, Krinos, and Rodents. The Hamid form is the human shape of the Ratkin. Few, however, would be considered handsome. Most are stooped and have some form of twitch, either beady eyes or protruding front teeth. The rare Chad Ratkin is a prodigious breeder and usually impregnates numerous human females to produce kinfolk who may later be infected with the birthing plague. The crinos form of the Ratkin makes the Ratkin approximately 20% larger with a rat's head, fur, claws, and a tail. The crinos Ratkin can also use human-sized weapons against their enemies. The rodent's form is the animal form of the ratkin, usually resembling one of the myriad types of rat in the world, as large or small as they might be. They can also use the rat's ability to compress their bones to escape through openings smaller than their bodies, balance on unsteady surfaces, and tear through solid objects. The rodent's form also features an opposable thumb, unlike normal rats. The Rokia before the birth of Gaia, there was the sea, the mother of all, the ever-changing and the formless. Sea in turn gave birth to three daughters, Set, Kun, and Kuril. The daughters of Sea were constantly struggling against each other. Their strife was so violent that they created the Unsea, or land. The sisters ventured onto Unsea and shaped it to their desires. Kuril ventured into the Unsea and climbed into the Oversea, or the sky, and tore a wound into it which boiled the sea where it touched it. Kuhn healed the wound to the sea with a balm known as the moon. 
Coral was then barred from touching the overseer, but she sought to close the wound she had created. In response, Kun created a race that would survive Quirrell's great unmaking, the Rokia. The three daughters of sea created life to walk on unsea and fly through oversea. The Rokia were mostly untouched by the War of Rage and the War of Shame. After all, who has ever heard of a wolf swimming in the sea? Preposterous. The Rokia continued in their patrols of the sea, punishing those mortals who offended it and following Kun's commands, foremost of which was to simply survive. And so they did. Until the Industrial Age, Rokia dominion of the sea was virtually unchallenged. At this time, humans unwittingly went to war against the sea and the Rokia. For their part, the were-sharks sent numerous ships into the embrace of coral, but still the humans continued to sail. Near the middle of the 20th century, the humans created the small wounds in the sea, better known as Little Boy and Fat Man, the nuclear bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The Rokia gathered at a grotto called Turna when the bombs were dropped, which nearly resulted in the destruction of their kind, as most Rokia were gathered there. The survivors of the small wounds left Turna and did as they wished, living between sea and unsea as they waited for the great unmaking. But the betweeners were soon challenged and driven to near extinction by the rest of the Rokia who never left the sea. The were sharks then decreed that any who walked on unsea could never return to the sea without facing the wrath of their own kind. The Rokia are divided as to how to approach the great unmaking, or the apocalypse. Some argue that they must breed with humanity and produce more Rokia, as humans have proven strong enough to withstand the perils of unsea. Other Rokia wish to swim in the deepest parts of the sea and wait until unsea is broken and sinks beneath the sea once more. In the meantime, Rokia may be found anywhere that great sharks swim, as well as a few places where they don't. Some Rokia, known as the Betweeners, live on the land. Others never so much as approach the unsea. The sacred duty of the Rokia is to survive and reproduce and hunt, all of which can be achieved in the sea which is why the ocean-bound Rokia so deeply despised the Betweeners. But on the other hand, Turna taught the Rokia a harsh lesson. Hiding in the sea may simply not be possible. If the Rokia are to survive, it might require peace with the Betweeners and the Samebito. But until the Betweener War is settled, the Rokia are unable to act as a single cohesive breed. The Rokia have had no need for actual organization. All of their gifts are learned from the spirits of the sea. The Rokia also have no shark kinfolk. They simply breed with any available shark, and each such union always produces another Rokia. Every shark-born Rokia, when the time of change comes on them, undertakes the long swim, a voyage of self-discovery and awareness, until they locate a spirit or Rokia who can lead them to a grotto, where they will meet with sea and learn the ways of their kind. But when the Rokia mate with a human, no Rokia will ever be born, only a kinfolk. But if a Rokia mates with a kinfolk, that pairing might breed true. Indeed, when a Rokia sets foot on unsea, they are overcome with a desire to breed, and no one knows why. Some suspect that Kuhn is pushing them to breed with humanity, but the ocean-bound Rokia regard this notion as offensive. There are only two breeds of Rokia, Hamid and Squamous. The Rokia do not breed with each other and therefore do not produce metis. Hamid-born Rokia rarely appear in the Middle Kingdom, and even less so outside of it. They undergo the urge for the long swim when they are adolescents. Shark-born Rokia consider the Hamids to be aberrations, fit only to be hunted and killed. Most, but not all. The Squamous are the majority of Rokia, Born from breeding with mako sharks, great whites, tiger sharks, hammerheads, blue sharks, threshers, and black tips, and bull sharks. Rokia only have three auspices that depend on when they are born. The brightwater Rokia are born when the sun is shining or a full moon is in the sky. Brightwaters are peerless warriors who swim near the surface rather than in the deep. They feel a connection to the oversea and the coral's wounding of it. The dim water Rokia are born during a cloudy day or a night when any moon except the full or new moons are ascendant. They are the leaders of the breed and the strongest proponents of the Betweener War, 
as well as the creators of fetishes. The dark water roki are known as the mad ones, having been born during an eclipse or a new moon. They are innovators and explorers, diving in the deepest depths of the sea. Most of the victories and worst defeats of the Rokia can be traced to one of the dark waters. The Rokia also have five forms, though only four are available to the shark born. The Hamid form, or the long fins, is the human shape of the Rokia. Hamid born Rokia appear to be mostly normal humans, albeit usually wall eyed, hard, muscular, and hunched. The glabrous form, or round back, is usually only entered by Hamid born Rokia or betweeners. A round back doubles the mass of the long fin's form and appears to be a hunched, bulky humanoid with shark-like traits, including a short dorsal fin. The gladius form, or the standing jaws, is the crinos form of the Rokia, a huge shark-man hybrid with the power of the fighting jaws form and the versatility of the round back form. However, most Rokia do not use this form very often. The chasmus form, or the fighting jaws form, is the preferred battle shape for most Rokia, as it is nothing less than a monstrous shark nearly twice the size of a common shark of the same species. The swimming jaws form is the form Rokia spend most of their time in, and is typically a larger representative of their particular species of shark. And those were the changing breeds. That was a lot of information. But despite its length, it really was an overview, I promise. I already know Bastet fans might be slightly displeased with me, but who knows? Maybe you'll get more cat people later. I've stated before my less than favorable opinion of Werewolf, half having to do with the game itself and the other half having to do with some of the players, specifically the horror stories I've both seen and heard relating to them, ranging from standard issue murder hoboing to the type of sexual proclivities that would get you permaban from the D forum. But the Pharah are, in my opinion, a good idea, especially with different shapeshifters taking up different roles in service to Gaia. They also add to the tragic mood of Werewolf, the idea that all of the destruction and desperation of the end times might have been avoided if the Pharah, and the Garu in particular, had been able to cooperate. Also, I think the Ananasi are the most interesting of the changing breeds, and I've toyed with the idea of there being more insect shifters in service to the weaver, like ants, bees, hornets, scorpions, mosquitoes, grasshoppers, and of course, the rhinoceros beetle, because this guy is my guy. Hi, podcast. <laughs> Anyway, that's all I have for now. Until next time. Okay, wait, 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 wait a minute. I have an announcement. While I was away, apparently 12,000 of you were somehow convinced to subscribe to this channel, to which I say, thank you. Thank you very much. And if you haven't subscribed, get on the bandwagon with the rest of the cool kids. And speaking of the cool kids, when this video is published, I'm going to open a comment for questions, and if I get enough good ones, I'll turn them into a 12,000 subscriber Q&A video, keyword being subscribers.
your questions go to the front of the line. And just to set some guardrails, keep the questions about tabletop games. I will not tell you how to navigate the dark web, I will not post feet pics, and I will not live stream a playthrough of Sekiro Shadows Die Twice because that would just be embarrassing for all of us. Now, that's all I have. Until next time.